so you've had a chance to watch the evolution of organizations and the evolution of leadership in the context of organizations. So what would you say has sort of stood the test of time? 40 years ago, it was still important. It was important to do in leadership. It's still important now to do in leadership. So for leadership per se, the eternal truths go back mm. many millennia. I mean, it's always who manages to motivate, inspire, and change. Mm -hmm. But since the Second World War, which many of the people who are listening may not even remember why we had a second. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a first before that. But post-war period was a time of democratizing many different things. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in the world of organizations, too, mm -hmm. that had start if we did a little history, we go back to the railroads. In fact, Harvard Business School started as maybe a school of railroad management, yeah. but we became something more. And so there was a structure that was quite clear. But the democratizing of organizations, the idea of breaking through, breaking out. Um, I grew up um, just after the organization man, so both mm -hmm. constrained and also a creature of the organization and a man, and I didn't like that. And yet there were movements. I happened to be reading something by Warren Bennis the other day because of the book I'm writing, and I'm gonna try to put in a shout out where he said, boy, change is everywhere. He said that like 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and he mentioned exactly the same kinds of changes we're coping with now whether it's racial justice. He may have mentioned women, but he talked about breaking organizational constraints. He talked about the environment. He talked about many things that are building communities, cities. He talked globalization. He talked about many things that are salient today. So I have merely traced an era, and I think that's an era where, even though there's a little bit of autocracy in mm -hmm. the world today, there's also pushback at autocracy, and it's a world where anybody feels that they can push back. Mm -hmm. They don't feel um, that they have to take it, mm -hmm. whatever is being given to them, and that's everywhere in the world. Now, sometimes they have to take it, and the protest goes underground. Mm -hmm. It's also true that protest by itself doesn't make change, mm -hmm. but it's a useful tool, mm -hmm. and I think we're in the world of the small, smart innovation. And that's what big companies have discovered and throughout my whole career, I helped them discover it. And I remember I talked to companies now that had had me in to you know, give a little dose of whatever wisdom there was to their managers who said, oh, you know, that was a little radical for us. That was the change masters where I talked about how do you get more innovation, which every established company craves, mm -hmm. and they're all trying to be like startups, buy startups. Well, the startup or the self-directed innovation, whether inside something established or outside something established, I think is the new wave of, of the evolution of democracy. Mm -hmm. It's not whether you vote, it's whether you create. And what made America a beacon for the world wasn't simply voter rights, because we weren't so good at that. It was participation yeah. at the community level. That's what de Tocqueville said about America. Gee, they're all forming associations to do something or other. And I don't think that self-help is totally the thing that will improve the world. We need a little boost from the established structures. We need a governmental framework that makes it work. We need established organizations that get it. But in fact, this idea that you can do it yourself. So when I said empowerment, it's now empowerment writ large. And that's what links all these ideas about leadership. So it's no longer, if we once had decades and millennia before we once had, except for the Athenian democracies, but we had emperors mm -hmm. and we had people who wanted to conquer and we had an awful lot of people that had no idea what was going elsewhere and they basically took it. Then we had a renaissance and we had more people who started to create and then we had the era of democracies, which are a little troubled now and we have to get it back, mm -hmm. but 
Even so, it was a small number of people relative Lee. Mm. And now I think it's the era of the small, smart innovation. So my new book, um, which I'm madly working on right <laughs> now, um, which will be out around January 2020, is called Think Outside the Building. And that's an interesting metaphor for established structures um, because education isn't the classroom, health isn't the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. But the subtitle is How Advanced Leaders can change the world one smart innovation at a time. And so it's not just what individual entrepreneurs do, although some manage to transform the world right away because it's a big idea that capture, captures the mood of the time. But for others, it's one smart innovation linked to lots of other smart innovations that create a wave and do start to make change. Mm -hmm. Every time I listen to you uh, or even read your work, there is a force of optimism in, um, in your energy, in your speech, in your way of framing things. And so uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's uplifting. But I wonder, after the length of time in your career, do, are there times where you look around at an organizational world um, and think, geez, I thought we would have been further along than this. I can't believe we're still wrestling with this. Yeah, well, I, I have some of those thoughts because there are certain things that where I thought there would be a parade. But some of what we're wrestling with are human tensions, human dilemmas. They've been wrestled with a long time. And I do read history. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I am an intellectual um, and... But I am the trajectory of the world. I, I'm optimistic, but it can take a long time. So there was that statement, was it Martin Luther King, about the arc of the world bends slowly, but it bends toward justice. Well, each time it bends and then snaps back, though, we've made a little progress and can build on it the next wave on gender justice and gender equality at the moment. I actually believe that we are poised for enormous change. And while there was a quiet period, the New York Times just said that, in between men and women of the corporation and um, today's activism, the fact that there are so many people who feel free to speak out, mm -hmm. so the numbers are growing. Mm -hmm. And when I hear problems, I hear that people are able to articulate them. And the first step in solving problems is that you say it out loud, you name it, and you create a movement behind it. Mm -hmm. So I do sound optimistic and energetic, yes. And that can be a negative because I'm not always right. Um, and there are huge problems. I start the new book. It, it's kind of a gloomy chapter, and I'm trying to figure out how to ungloom it, but about the fact that we have an enormous, an enormous bag of problems in the world, and many are getting worse. And even the ones that seem to get better are getting worse in spots. Like, for example, one of the great triumphs of the last century is health and improvements in longevity. The life cycle has more or less doubled on average. However, the life expectancy in Stillwater, Oklahoma is 56 years because of an enormous number of problems we haven't solved and left behind people and left behind areas. So I actually, I kind of like the idea that there are problems to solve, so we're not complacent. What makes us human is the desire to Im impact our universe, to make things better. At least, I hope most of us feel that way. I believe that that's in us and inherent in being human. So I do sound, I always sound upbeat and optimistic, but I can tell you a million things are wrong. But I get very impatient with whining. Mm -hmm. I want all the people who think it's wrong, and, you know, I have, I'm, as I said, I'm an intellectual, and one of the things many intellectuals do is they're smarter than other people because they see the dark underside and they can criticize. They can find something wrong with anything. And my MBA students, too, can improve on every leader in the universe. Sometimes it's hard for them to improve on Nelson Mandela until his succession didn't look like it went as well as it should have. But um, we don't, we, I mean, if we whine about it, we're, we're victims. 
we have to live with it. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of sayings, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, my own personal, I've tweeted them, I tweet them a lot, I have to start writing them again. But um, one is the, f the four reasons any action is better than none, mm -hmm. and passivity depresses. Yeah. Action energizes. And so if we wanna be healthy, we need purpose and meaning. Yeah. If we want to be healthy, we need to tackle things. And I found another one of my favorite blog titles was The Happiest People Tackle the Most Difficult Problems. When we're talking about change, um, you've done a beautiful job of explaining, I think, change in a historical perspective and also helping us uh, remember that uh, I guess every, at some level everything old is new again. We've been dealing with a lot of these things but uh, for a long time. What, what I'd love your thoughts on is should we be uh, having a different relationship with change? Should our relationship with how we think about change, how we participate in change, how we are prepared to be in change, um, sh should we be evolving uh, in any way? Is there anything we should be uh, better at? I guess, in relation so I to think change. The, I, I think the next wave, the next stage, it's connected. And naturally, I think it because that's what I'm writing about, is even bigger change. That is, there are the things in daily life, there are lots of things that leadership and organization development do that are very micro and mm -hmm. very important because if we don't transform ourselves, we can never transform the world. Mm -hmm. But I think world now, and I think that... Um, we do know a lot about what makes organizations effective. And that, I don't wanna say it's totally boring, but it's a little boring. How many glosses can there be on some management handbook of this or that? We do have to cope with technology, and people who don't understand the technology think it's very different, and it does have implications, but again, I've been hearing about some of those implications since the early days of the PC, mm -hmm. when companies were thinking about, they were still calling it office automation, but what was gonna happen, what would happen to the jobs, and also how do we deal with this new weird thing? I realize AI is different, but I think it's gonna be a tool, like a lot of things are tools. The same way that a vacuum cleaner is a tool, and it unlocked a lot of productive potential. Um, so there are those kinds of things inside organizations, but most of the challenges that even organizations face are challenges outside the building. They have to do with the institutional structure or the ecosystem around organizations. And sometimes people don't have to worry about that too much in more routinized jobs or jobs lower in those hierarchies that still remain, but hierarchies are collapsing. But in very big organizations, they know their place. However, even in very big organizations, there's a desire for innovation, and that means trying to empower even those people to do new things and think about new things and wear those new things. They're not at your desk. They're not in your work table. They're not in your locker if you have a new style office. They're outside the building, and they're with partners and collaborators you never thought about before, mm -hmm. and they have to do with things that are much broader, and you have to solve problems to get the new market opportunities. So you want a new market opportunity in, it, the food industry has certainly encountered this because they worry about the supply chain, and they have to nurture small farmers in, in less developed countries, and so they need a lot of people who would otherwise have been sitting in offices to be out on the road knowing those kinds of partners if they mm -hmm. want to have enough peanut supply, for example, even though we're allergic, many people are allergic to peanuts. Mm -hmm. um, and business per se, um, it's hard to tell because the boundaries are blurring. So sometimes you're a for-profit doing a for-profit activity. Sometimes you're partnered with a not-for-profit to get done what you need to do. One of my favorite stories and um, examples that I had the good fortune to um, be associated with is Procter & Gamble was trying to build a business initially out of a water purification tablet because it came in a kind of size and could be marketed the way they market a lot of their products, which can be in small packages. 
and it seemed to be a perfect one, huge need all over the world, and it was hard to sell it for many reasons. And we do have to solve water problems. Even in the U.S., we have to solve water problems. I mean, we're getting very third-worldly in some places. So they had these tablets, and they're trying to sell them, and it's competing for resources with all their other products, Tide and all the others, which, by the way, they've also used not-for-profits and social impact and social change to infuse those products with meaning. And they ended up deciding this was too important. I can, I'm not going to go through the whole litany about why it was hard to sell. But they ended up deciding that it was too good not to have available to the world, and they made it an NGO. So they turned it into an NGO, and they were partnering with the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., with U.N. agencies, and it was available at low cost, and it was given away, and it was a for-profit setting up a not-for-profit to keep a kind of product that reflected their values alive. And the thinking that goes on to that is a different kind of thinking. It's outside the building thinking. And I was a judge. This is dis full disclosure. I was a judge for a contest that American Express had for um, social innovations that were changing the world. And they were giving big prizes. I was so happy to be a judge because Wynton Marsalis was also a judge, and I'm a huge fan. But yet we never convened because we did everything by email. But the winner of that prize was the Procter & Gamble NGO product Pure. And I remember saying to my fellow judges, but wait a minute, do we want to give this Social in Innovation Award to a giant for-profit corporation? And then we decided yes, because what they had done had such high impact in the potential to not just improve lives through better health, but get people to work. They weren't going to be sick as often, and it was affordable. I mean, it just had so many virtues. And I think there is a, there is a lot of work to be done, and there are a lot of markets to be created and found, so for-profit companies have to look at that. But everybody has to look at it because the problems of the world are no longer distant and you don't have to care about them. They intrude on your doorstep every day because we not only know about it through the media, but they often come to wherever our developed area is to haunt us. Mm. And we can no longer wall off um, the problems and live in these fantasy worlds. It's, it's up to us to do something about climate change is probably the biggest example of that, which not only does not respect your socioeconomic status or your work, although in fact the poor suffer from it more than the more affluent, but it affects everybody and it's gonna make a huge difference. ISA is uh, made up of organizations who are in the learning and development field. And what has happened in organizational life over the last three to four decades is uh, being a successful leader, being successful in an organization has grown in complexity. Um, so as we, th as we as learning and development providers, we can't develop people in the organizational context to be all things to all people. Do you have a point of view of, boy, if we're going to be successful in um, uh, building organizations that are vibrant and healthy and contributing to society in a vibrant and healthy way, we need to have people who have these kinds of skill sets. Do you have sort of a priority when you think about how do we have to grow as individuals to, to be in a better world? Well, first of all, you can tell that um, I'm a great believer in the, the way of democracy and the opportunities we give people. So openness is one of the most important things, open minds, open boundaries. And in terms of training people, I mean, one thing I worked on with IBM that um, I worked on a lot of things with IBM because they had a lot of vision about how they could impact the world and grow their business. Um, and one thing was their corporate service core. First of all, I'm a huge advocate of, of national service. Um, I was 
on the board almost from the beginning of a premier national service organization in the U.S., which is now also in the U.K. and South Africa, City Year. And I think it's one of the few things we could do that would level the social divides, prepare people for work, and take advantage of the idealism of young people. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, IBM started a corporate service corps as they were looking at how do they develop global leaders of the future. And I'm a big advocate of you learn by doing. You don't learn by, although I learn a lot by reading, I must say, <laughs> reading, listening, whatever, but then there's a doing component. And so that involved um, diverse teams who would get release time, and that was a big hard sell, you know, our best people, and they would get release time and they would go tackle a problem in a geography that most of them, practically all of them, were not familiar with, that had no commercial interest yet for IBM. I mean, it might eventually, Vietnam, for example, mm -hmm. or certain places in the US, um, South Africa. But um, that was powerful because it did many things simultaneously. It gave people a different sense of themselves. It gave them a different sense of their possibilities. It opened their eyes to the world. It gave them a new network of connections of people who were very different from them. Those are the things that last, not the specifics you learn, but the ability to forge relationships very quickly with people who are different, to open your eyes to situations you've never been in before, to be curious. Um, you know, I've got a whole litany of things because that's what Think Outside the Building is all about. Um, you know, how to, where do you catch ideas? Where do they come from? Well, they come from what I call far afield trips, going far beyond what you know and is comfortable. They come from shaking up your assumptions. They come from when you have an idea, I say pitching a big tent, make it capacious, room for a lot of people to act on their vision within your vision. So all of those things are enduring. And I think they've been true of the best leaders. Mm -hmm. And often people at higher ranks and people that get an opportunity to change the world. Now we want those innovations coming from anywhere and entrepreneurs need that too. And of course there is this startup craze. So I would say besides um, service as a tremendous way to, to teach and learn, the other thing is entrepreneurship startups. Um, I am um, really intrigued with your Cantor's Law uh, everything can look like a failure in the middle. Will you talk a little bit about that, how you came to see that as a truth? And also maybe talk about, if you've got some wisdom to share, about how does one, when they're in the middle and you feel like a failure, is, is there uh, wisdom you could share about how you might know uh, that there are signs that that failure actually could ultimately lead to a success versus signs that it may be doomed to be on a failure track. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because I just finished a whole chapter just about that. Um, and in fact, how did I hit upon it? I don't know. I was um, listening. I mean, I learn from listening to people's own experiences. And sometimes all I'm doing is feeding back a lot of people's experiences. And then people say, gee, I recognize myself in that. And I want to say, well, of course, it was you telling me that. And so... The difference between success and failure is how long you give it before you give up. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are some reasons you should pull, pull out. But if you give up, by definition, it's a failure. So what's the middle? The middle is you're not giving up yet. You haven't ended it yet, and the middle could last a very long time. I mean, sometimes people have continued to pursue ideas for a huge amount of time, and that's the prehistory we never say when it, they look suddenly like an instant success. So it's a human characteristic to get rattled. There are so many reasons middles are difficult. You start running out of time and money because it's hard to forecast if what you're doing is new and different. Um, if you have a coalition of allies, there's dissension because they didn't all know that that's what you meant when they signed on to help you. So many reasons, unexpected obstacles, and pull out then, and it's a problem. And sometimes people do. I just did a little analysis of three reasons people get discouraged, too discouraged to continue. One is rigidity, mm -hmm. that 
they had an idea in mind and it had to come in exactly this form. They were not flexible enough to say, can we redirect a little? Could we modify that? And so without flexibility, they walked away from deals. Um, all right, that's been in the news a lot. But secondly, um, people are sometimes just too naive. When they built their idea, they didn't think about all the support they were gonna need, for example. They thought they could do it themselves. Um, and so they're just a little naive, and when they hit a middle, they have nobody to help them out. And then another reason is to be sidetracked, to be distracted. And a lot of successful people get too many invitations to be on boards, to be on a national commission, and those are very tempting. And Or you get lots of committees in your company, or you get lots of opportunities to invest in something, and then you have too much to do and can't stay focused, and it does take focus. So one of the tests of whether you give up or pursue is to see whether there's momentum in the idea. So going back to tuning into the environment, the random walks, is there still a need? Or has somebody else come along and has just taken away that need because they have an innovation that's so much better, the same need isn't there, the same opportunity isn't there. But if the need is there, that's a good thing, your vision. Does your vision, your, your big idea, does it still inspire people? Do you still care about it? Do you still have passion for it? Um, then there's your partners, your colleagues. Is support growing or is support diminishing? Has this taken so long that your supporters and investors are ready to give up or not? And so you check all of those things. And if the signs are positive, you keep going. And you might pivot. Pivot is a big word in the startup world because that means you started doing one thing and you end up doing something totally different. One of the, one of the best examples is Slack that started out doing a multiplayer game and well, that didn't work, but they had this great technology for how you get lots of people in a multiplayer game to collaborate and what is work but a multiplayer game. So they ended up with the tool for work and they could have given up but I think when you have that many investors and that much money, it's harder to give up. So I wonder if you would um, talk a little bit about the Harvard Advanced Leadership Institute. You are one of the founding creators. Uh, I am very intrigued. I think uh, many of the ISA members would be very intrigued. So I wonder if you'd share a little bit about how it came about, um, what the Institute's goals are, and what the experience has been so far. Okay, so um, the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative is still called an initiative at Harvard, sorry. not an institute, mm -hmm. and that just has to do with Harvard nomenclature, but it's certainly been institutionalized because one of the keys to institutionalizing is to build something and be able to pass it on um, in a way that continues it, and I don't have to do all that work. So I am, I'm a co-hatcher of the idea and the major founder or leader who built it. And so um, over a period of 14 years, so it took us a couple of years, three of us hatched the idea and it seemed right for the times, we loved the idea. It was that the problems of the world are mounting, um, lots of unsolved problems, they all need more and better leaders. And that's what universities are supposed to supply, but they don't always. And every school at Harvard was thinking about how they could add a little leadership, the medical school, public health, education, business was already doing that, um, government, um, even the graduate schools. So, on the undergraduate, certainly. So we saw that, and then we saw this new demographic that the baby boomers were um, about to have 20 to 30 more productive years after the time that official social institutions said they had to leave mm -hmm. their job. Now, not everybody works in a job where they're told to leave, and some people are in professions, and we have portfolio careers these days, so that people continue to do their professions, but they wanna do something a little else. So we saw those trends, we put it together, and we hatched this idea and we wrote it up and then we said to ourselves, now wait a minute, um, I mean, we're all intellectuals, consultants, we love putting ideas out there for other people to do. But we said, 
well, if anybody's going to believe this, they're going to ask, what are you doing at Harvard? So we had to shop it around and sell it. And we went through many changes of officials at Harvard. We found the right institutional home as a one Harvard whole university. And this was definitely outside of the building. We were outside of our own fields. We gathered people from lots of other disciplines. I, my colleagues looked at me and said, well, if this is going to happen, you're going to have to lead it. And so I didn't really, I hadn't, I had liked the idea of writing it and handing it on to other people. But I took it on and we finally, we figured out the model. We invented everything, although if you ask me officially to tell the history, I'll say we borrowed from lots of things that already existed because, by the way, if you're making radical change, make it sound conservative. Um, and so we were up and running with our first cohort. We're calendar year, not academic year, because mm -hmm. we figured that's how many adults lead their lives. We look for people with at least 25 years of leadership accomplishments. They had to be really tippy top and very experienced. And um, we started, our first cohort was calendar year 2009. They came in December 2008 for um, some orientation and they were some, somewhat fewer than what we had aimed at for the, for the first year. We said, let's get going anyway. And we had some really top-notch, well-known people, including um, Charlie Bolden, who halfway through the first year got asked by President Obama to become head of NASA. And I'll tell you, we've never lost a better person. I mean, we <laughs> dined out on Charlie Bolden being in our program, and people started noticing us. But then we started growing. And so from approximately um, 13, 14 people the first year, plus some officially registered partners because we wanted to be life stage appropriate. And by the time people have accomplished things in their career, they have spouses, they have families, they don't want to be separated from them. They might want the next stage in life to be with their spouse. So we have that option, which is very unique here and elsewhere. And um, so we had 13, 14, and three, four partners. Um, for 2000, what is this year, 2019, there are about 50 fellows and about 12 officially registered partners. So um, a lot of people and now hundreds of people. And our goal was not simply to create a new stage of higher education, but to create a new leadership force for the world to create people with the sensibility I've been talking about that could break out of their career constraints and tackle big problems without necessarily having their title anymore. It was hustle, not hierarchy. It was persuasion, not position. And there are some really remarkable projects well underway. I'm writing about a lot of them. Um, and. It's been a joy and a pleasure and also a huge amount of work. So I'm um, now able to stand back and cheer on this great team, great staff, large number of faculty from every discipline and field that teach in it. Can you share a little bit, Dr. Cantor, about um, some of the things they're learning in this program and maybe give an example or two about what they're doing after the program? Um, so first of all, you can call me Rosebeth. And um, so the, all the things I've been talking about is what they're learning, but, uh, but they get an opportunity to explore the entire university. This is not confined to any one field. And because of that, we actually encourage people to do things in fields other than the ones they've been in or that they're going in. This is not continuing education. This is opening your minds to new problems, new possibilities. So they do that. There's a core course that teaches advanced leadership skills, the large-scale, messy, systemic change. Everyone loves Canner's Law. We talk about the messy, miserable, muddled, murky middles. Um, and through case studies and discussions, they have examples. Then we have... Um, some deep immersions into particularly important fields where they learn the substance of science like climate change or public health 
Um, and then we have a lot of things focused on helping them identify a project. And we start in a very um, easy way. We have them identify a domain and critique each other, and then we bring back past fellows who also can, can critique it, um, add to it, partner with them, and then a lot of the rest of the calendar year is spent developing the project and presenting it to a public audience and also um, connecting with lots of other fellows. And, and some of the connections have been remarkable. We have people working across cohorts and they do a range of things. We have two people that found one another at one of our, we call it cross cohort exchanges, and um, they are bringing alternative affordable energy to Liberia. Um, and by bringing solar cells, it'll be a model for Africa. Um, they were both lawyers, but they didn't know each other, and they were from very different worlds. We have somebody who has, um, well, we have a couple, and um, actually they were both fellows because they were both equally accomplished professionals who have taken on the refugee crisis, mm -hmm. and they are realized there was a gap in that um, there was nothing identifying skilled refugees. It turns out of the 25 million refugees in the world, there are some proportion that were highly accomplished in their home countries have a lot of skills. Mm -hmm. And there's an awful lot of companies and countries that are eager for skills. And so they started a talent match. It's more than that because they want to change government policies to make it easier to come in on a work because an employer wants you. And so they're working with refugee-friendly companies, right now Canada and Australia. And um, they have, uh, they started a skills bank. They got about 10,000, 11,000 people to put their skills in. They have matched them with companies. And sometimes it's amazing skills. A company in Australia needed butchers. Um, there was another company that needed people who knew roofing. Um, but they also have a lot of accountants and consultants, and some of the big consulting firms have signed on. And so they're really demonstrating because the couple dozen people so far that have been resettled, that's a small, that's a small thing so far, but it's a model. And they have NGOs and the UN and the governments of these countries all watching, and they may change the policies of countries. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty amazing. And there's so many more stories like that. I don't want to bother you with the stories. And they were both lawyers of different, different kinds. He had worked as, um, as chief of staff for the Senate Judiciary Committee. And she had been a co-founder of a law firm. Um, and, but they had the things that people have at that stage of life to bring to it. I talk about it as the three C's. Once they get over the career constraints, they have three C's, they have capabilities, they have connections, and they have cash. And a lot of these things sometimes are self-funded. They're very much bootstrap entrepreneurs, but they also raise money. They had a State Department grant. They had the UN High Commissioner on Refugees endorsing them. Um, the guys, I happen to only talk about lawyers, but we have C, um, CEOs, entrepreneurs, um, physicians, we, this is every profession. So I'm no longer simply talking about people who've been in the C-suite. Um, they often do very well because they understand how to mobilize big teams. Mm -hmm. And lawyers sometimes have a harder time. But um, they're all people with values and a sense of mission who understand purpose and meaning. And they're in, I think of it now as a new club. Mm. And I think that club's going to grow. Yeah. I know that CEOs and senior executives love getting awards for the good things their companies do or they do. That's the new club, is getting recognized for doing really good things. It's not for having a lot of power. And there may be some people who would like to be in the Forbes 400 list, but an awful lot of people I know don't particularly want to flaunt their wealth. Um, they That doesn't provide joy. Joy comes from purpose and meaning and be acknowledge, being acknowledged by your peers and by the people you serve as having done something with impact. You've been very successful. You've influenced a lot of people, um, including me. Uh, your work has done exactly that, brought us forward, um, enabled us to imagine 
um, a, a different kind of future, a better future. Um, what has inspired you? What's kept you going? What has lifted you up? What, how have you done it? Well, first of all, I want to say to you and to everybody who's watching this, this is incredibly flattering. And as I listen to you, I think you're not talking about me. I mean, I just do my work and I don't think a lot. I like to celebrate other people. I don't think a lot about that. I do what needs to be done. And right now we have a big world to fix and somebody has to fix it. And my way of fixing it wasn't necessarily to do a lot of things myself. It was to mobilize these hundreds of people and hopefully those hundreds are gonna become thousands, they're gonna become millions. We are trying to document how many lives have been touched by the things that the Advanced Leadership Fellows are doing. Um, and it's big numbers, but if it's digital, it's easy to get big numbers. Um, so there, it's, it's, you have to be motivated by the work to be done and it is, who wants, I mean, I said whine, whining isn't a lot of fun. Um, sitting around and criticizing without figuring out a way around isn't satisfying, although it may satisfy the intellectuals who are then smarter than everybody else because they see the flaws. I say if you see a flaw, think about an initiative that would fill that gap, that would fix it. We don't hide from the flaws, in fact, optimists tend to see problems more than pessimists do, according to some of the research, because pessimists just give up. Optimists feel they can do something about it. So I don't know where it comes from, but so far it's worked, and, um, and I just feel, I don't know what I'll do. People say, well, you're writing a book that's coming out in January. That means I ne have to be nearly finished now. Um, yes, soon, and then they say, what are you doing next? I don't know. I'm going to see what needs to be done. And I don't want to say that the work finds you, but when I talked before about far afield trips, sometimes the work does find you, and sometimes you have to sort out what's worth doing, what isn't doing. I've had dead ends. I've had false starts. I mean, um, and I don't feel that I've reached my potential. So I've got to keep looking for whatever that might be. And so it makes me incredibly honored to have this award from people who are doing work that I value so much. And I just wish all of you the best as you move forward to fix all the things that need to be fixed. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. And congratulations again for being ISA's 2019 Thought Leader. And best of luck in finishing the book. We will look forward to reading it. Thinking outside the building. Thank, Thank you. you.